OK. Let's start. So my camera is a little bit failing today. I don't know why. So uh, just my camera, OK? So I will try to fix that. OK, so we are recording. No, stop recording. OK. All right, so welcome to lecture number nine. Uh, today we will talk about uh, uh, microbiology basics. So we will talk about infections. Uh, uh, we are talking about immune disorders. Uh, what is a communicable disease? Uh, what is an infection disease? We will talk about the bacteria, the classification of bacteria. What are the most important bacteria that you must re, uh, study for or have keep in mind for your program? Uh, remember, I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not teaching basically what is not necessary, right? So I probably mention it, I'm going to illustrate, but what I remark is what I want you to study. So don't try to don't try to write down everything I said again, because at the end you will not understand what you even writing. All right, so then we will talk about the lymphatic system, the lymphatic system and some disorders of the lymphatic system. All right, so let's start. Okay, so please, I will encourage you, your participation, your participation, and your uh, and your uh, uh, questions, please. Okay, all right. So let's start with the microbiology basics. So what you see here, and this is one of the uh, things I I I put it. I like this this cartoon. Why? Because what you see there, some bacteria, right? And the bacteria, see, are going to increase in size. No, they are going to increase in number. You see that? See that? Yes. No. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So yes. that means that what I'm trying to tell you here is this: that these bacteria are able to reproduce very fast. Bacteria are going to reproduce very fast. The pen, the paper, the book, the laptop, your cell phone. You have these bacteria, so you need to clean it. Uh, uh, once in a while, right? Why is that? If you see here, the bacteria is going to reproduce very fast and average reproduction is going to take about 20 minutes. Every 20 minutes, the bacteria reproduce. So what does it mean? If I have 1,000 bacteria right now, in 20 minutes, I will have double, 2,000. If I have 1 million bacteria, in 20 minutes, I will have 2 million bacteria. So what would be the conclusion? You as a nurse, you need to just realize why is that important to know? Because, because if you let the infection progress, the more bacteria you will find is more easier to fight against 1 million bacteria rather than to fight with 20 million bacteria. Yes or no? Yes. 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 Right? So, as a conclusion, so just to close this this part, is the early detection of an infection the best results you will obtain. You got it? Yes. Yes. Okay. So you will need to identify uh, what are the most common infections that happen in the facilities, in the hospital, and all that. And I just tell you ahead of time that the most common infection that you will be able to see in these facilities is the uh, respiratory infections, respiratory infections, and UTIs. So either way, so if you have catheters in the urinary bladder, like Foley catheters, it is increase the risk for urinary tract infections and the respiratory infections. And we are going, are going to teach you how to identify earlier a problem with a, resp with a respiratory system. If you have an infection that is very common, there are some signs that you can detect earlier. And I'm going to teach you that. Uh, and that's what we call the clinical eye. Clinical eye. Before laboratory tests, before the vital signs are going to be dramatically changed, you are going to start suspecting, anticipating what could be a problem in this patient. You okay with that? Yes. 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 Okay. 
All right, so here we have uh, actually the, uh, uh, we have the, uh, the main causes of, uh, this is a little bit 2013, it's like uh, seven, uh, eight years ago, but definitely the order is the same, basically the same. So what I'm trying to show you here is the number one cause of death are going to be diseases of the heart. So besides the percentage, you don't need to, you don't need to uh, actually remember, memorize that. But the most common cause of death is myocardial infarction. It's going to be about 700,000 people a year in the United States. The second most common cause of, uh, of death, causes of death, that is mortality. Mortality. Mortality means the number of deaths in a year. It's going to be the second uh, cancers. Third, chronic lower, lower respiratory, respiratory diseases. So this is the uh, area that we are going to basically find for the first time that one of the complications of the respiratory and causes of death of respiratory system is going to be pneumonias, means infections, infections. So it's kind of a common situation that you're going to see that there are going to be a, uh, 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 how often you will see these problems in the hospitals, hospitals, etc. Okay. All right, so let's start talking about what is a disease. A disease, a disease is a, basically any sense changing from normal. So what is going to change? Basically the function, the physiology, the physiology. Please, I want one of the main things that you need to check in a disease is that the functions of the body are changing. How do you check the functions of the body are changing? That is basically the importance of the vital signs. Vital signs. The vital signs are start to modify. So if, for example, if you have lack of oxygen in your body, what is doing the respiratory system? They are going to increase the respiratory rate. And with that, you are going to increase the heart rate. So now, because the distribution of oxygen is proportional to the, to the breathing. So you have, you have for each breathing, you have about eight pulses. That is the range that you see. Homework, go home, stay in the place and check how many times you are breathing and take the pulse at the same time. And you will see that the rate is between, between six to eight. That is the normal rate. Just, just to, uh, to be curious on that, right? So you're not going to check, uh, check the rate in the patient. But what happened in the respiratory system that the respiratory rate started to change. Could be faster, could be slower, or could be deeper or could be superficial. So this is something that is uh, 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 telling you that the patient is having a problem with the respiratory system, a disease. So what is a disease, just yes, in conclusion? Disease is going to be any deviation of the uh, functions of the of the of the of the organ or system disease so any alteration of the uh, functions of the of the organ or system that is called disease so a disease is going to be having changes on the physiology and then it's going to have changes on the anatomy tell me which one is changing first in the disease the function or the anatomy So body. Anatomy. The, the anatomy. function. Anatomy. Who said anatomy? Anatomy, yes? Yeah. Yes, anatomy. Yeah. So the first scene, and this is what we call an axioma, that is almost uh, a universal truth, let's put it in medicine, that the first scene that is going to change, the first scene is going to change is the physiology, the function of the organ, the function of the organ. Okay, the function of the organ. So changing the function of the organ is number one. So that's why you need to rely in your laboratory tests. Laboratory tests are telling you that you have some changes on the function before that is, uh, before to be evident for anatomical changes. So I'm going to give you an example. For example, you have, uh, you have, um, uh, a cirrhosis, cirrhosis. You know what is cirrhosis, right? 
cirrhosis. Yes. Cirrhosis, a patient who is alcoholic or, or a patient who has a chronic hepatitis B or C, whatever, the liver is going to be destroyed. All right. The liver is not going to make any complaint, any complaint, any complaint until the 80 percent of the liver is being destroyed. Yes. If you cut 50 percent of your liver, you will not feel any difference. So that's why we call the liver a noble organ, noble organ. Anyhow. So you start to have actually uh, you have alcohol, uh, take alcohol. And the alcohol what produce is inflammation of the liver, inflammation of the liver. Inflammation, when I said inflammation, you need to have in your mind two things. Number one, the five cardinal signs that we already talked. And num uh, number one, and number two, you need to know that inflammation means that some cells are being destroyed already. Inflammation means that there's some destruction of the cells already. Okay, so there's going to be an inflammatory process for many years. The patient is having alcohol for 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years, and the liver is not complaining. But suddenly, when this 80% of the liver is destroyed, the liver starts to have some problems. Remember that A, B, C, and D, the functions of the liver, remember that? A, B, C, D, what yeah. are the functions yes. of the liver? A means what? Give me an A. Um, Everybody. Sure. Absurd. Albumin. 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 Write it down 100 times. Albumin. B. Bile. Bile. Formation of bile. C. What is Coagulation, Coagulation factors. factors. Coagulation factors. And D. Detoxification. 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 So all these functions are not working. All right? So now, the liver is still in the normal size. So there is no anatomical changes. But when passing all this time and the liver basically after many years of injuries, inflammation, destruction of the cells, finally the liver start to replace the normal tissue into a scar tissue, a scar tissue. You know what is a scar? These white fibers in, in some parts of the body, scars. So this scar is not normal liver tissue. So the scars are going to replace. The liver at the beginning is going to measure about 20 centimeters long. 18, uh, 18 to 22 centimeters long. But now it's going to shrink to the half, 10 centimeters, after many years of being injured the liver. So that means that the function are changing first and then the anatomy. Another example, more brief here, is the rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis. You have somebody who has rheumatoid arthritis. Basically, let's make an example of the knee. The knee. The knee, basically, you have pain. It's, it's inflamed, right? So this, then they are going to take medications. They are going to take medication. So and that is means that you are limping. The function is changing, correct? Function is changing. But tell me, that same patient after 20, 30 years, how this knee is going to look? Is going to be looking as before? No, they are going to have some deformities. Yes or no? Yes. So that is another proof that the functions are changing first and then the anatomy. Never forget that. You okay with that? Yes. Okay. So now we have here the, uh, uh, all right, so any question? No. No. All right. So let me bring my, my pen tablet, please. Okay, this is a pen tablet. All right, so let's talk about the categories of the diseases. Oh, so it's upside down always. Okay, so we have uh, infections, nutritional disease disorders, metabolic disorders, immuno immunological, immunological disorders, psychiatric disorders, degenerative disorders, neoplasm. So this is really important. Why? Because you can identify what could be without making any diagnosis, but you have the suspicious and you anticipate what could be a problem to be prepared yourself. You need to be always oriented to know what to expect. OK, so for this, for example, I will tell you, we have an infection. So tell me uh, who who most likely have infections. 
any say you can do that. Huh? Children. Children, right? Children, they have all, all, all the time infection, viral infection, cold, sneeze, sneezing, right? So they have basically a respiratory infection, so viral infection, yes or no? Infections. But that, that's a, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean what well, this is my point. That doesn't mean that an adult or early do not have infection. But you need to go for what is the most common situations. And the most common situations, if you see a, a kid coming through the through the door in the hospital or in a clinic, what you're going to think? Cancer? No, you don't think cancer. You think about myocardial infarction? No, you don't think about myocardial infarction. The kid is having four or five years. What is the most common? The most common will be a, an infection. Okay, you got my point? Yes. Okay, yes. Uh, that's what we are going to see in the next slide. All right, so infection. First of all, what is an infection? Uh, oh, God. What is this? All right, what is an infection? Infection, infection, invasion. You got it? Infection, invasion. Invasion of what? Invasion of bacteria, invasion of viruses, parasites, etc. So you can tell that infection is the invasion and you can call bacterial infection. Very, 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 totally right. Bacterial infection. You can say, viral infection viral infection because the virus is going to invade and the body and replicate and spread out the same happened with the bacteria all right so that is you can say very uh, always uh, viral infection you can say bacterial infection you can say fungal infection fungal infection the fungus are going to invade and spread out you can say protozoal infection, like amoeba, malaria, those are protozoa. So protozoal infection. And uh, you can say another infection, uh, fungal infection, protozoal infection, parasite infection, parasites, parasite, the worms that you uh, uh, probably you hear someday or in the past, worms are, why? Because they invade and spread out. So my point is that infection, don't think that is, take, get a, a, out from your mind that infection is just for bacteria. Infection is not just bacteria. So if you said infection, you need to, you need to think about what kind of infection, bacteria, virus, fungus, protozoa, or parasites. We got it? So don't be afraid to say viral infection. Those fungal infection. Infection is the word. All right, so infection most, most likely is going to happen in children, right? More children. So if you see somebody coming on your door with children, uh, probably you need to think infection, but definitely you need to do the nursing process. That is the, uh, start with the nursing process. That are, are you doing nursing process in fundamentals already or no? Yeah. Yes. So what is the first step for nursing process? Assessment. And what is the part of the assessment? Data. Sorry? Data collection. Day of what? Day. Sorry, data collection. Like information. Data collection, collection. Collection of what? Taking information from the patient. Okay. So I will give you uh, a, 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 a look at this, please. Assessment, you're going to do the clinical history. First, is that collection of uh, uh, in fundamentals they tell you the subjective and objective data, correct? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the history, you're going to subdivide, subdivide it in the uh, present, present that is the, what is the main complaint? Main complaint. Okay. Then you're going to go to present. What is the main, what, uh, how you feel today? I have pain. Oh, this pain, how is this pain? So you start to uh, have re collect information, subjective and objective information, signs and symptoms that we are going to make it clear today. 
then you're going to talk about the past. The past will be, for example, yesterday, a week ago, a, when was this pain repeated? Was uh, in the past the pain was the same or different, right? How you treat the 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 uh, the, the the problem? Now, if you are having a patient who is just admitted, is being in admission, you need to add another that is family history, family history, family history. But if the patient is on the on the hospital and you actually, the patient is already admitted, you don't need to ask for family history anymore because it's already in the, in the, on the records, okay? Now, you go to present, past, and then you're going to do the laboratory test. Laboratory test, laboratory test. So, you, do you need to, what I mean doing laboratory test? No, you don't need to, uh, 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 responsible completely of laboratory tests. You are responsible partially of that because you need to read what are the latest laboratory tests. Laboratory tests are important because they are going to confirm, they are going to confirm a problem. So you always, even you don't need laboratory tests, you must, I'm telling you for, and listen to me, you need to think always about laboratory tests. Even though that is not relevant, you need to think about laboratory tests. Because if you don't think laboratory tests, you're going to miss it. Sometimes you miss things because you don't think about it. Okay, because, oh, and if you organize your brain, your mind, in order to be in this sequence, you will not be actually losing anything. Okay, so we have the clinical history, we have the laboratory test, then we have the vital signs, the vital signs, vital signs, vital signs, you know, the vital signs, and then the uh, physical exam. That is the whole part of the assessment. You okay with that? So yeah. we have one, we have two, three, and four. All right. So if you follow that order, if you feel, if you going to feel, you going to follow that order all your life, you are going to be very unlikely to miss scenes during the assessment of the patient. Okay, you got it? Yes. yes. All right, so infections we are going to see in kids, uh, basically, but I'm not telling you that we don't have infection. Adult, elderly people do actually have infections, but the most common you will see in kids. Nutritional diseases. Nutritional diseases is it can happen at any age, right? Depends. Depends of the, uh, what is SES? SES, write down that, social economic status. People who are, for example, homeless or uh, low of income or very poor income, etc. Nutritional diseases, especially that it can happen at any age, at any age. In the United States, it can be at any age. But if I go to other areas, other countries, probably kids are going to be mostly affected. But nutritional diseases, and for that, you're going to get nutrition in next class and with me. So you will recognize who is very well nourished, who is not very well nourished. People, for example, will tell you, alcoholics. Alcoholics are very well nourished or malnourished? Malnourished. Malnourished. Why? Because you put a bottle of vodka and put it a piece of uh, rib eye or New York steak, which is going to pick up the alcohol, right? So basically, it's going to be malnourished, this patient. You got it? Okay. Patient for, for example, another malnourished here. Uh, uh, elderly people. Why elderly people? Tell me, elderly people have problems to swallow food? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Right? So if they don't swallow food, why they don't, they can swallow? They have, they're afraid to, to choke or no? Right? Because every time they swallow, they are actually having problems of choking. Right? And that with the time, in one day, one week, one month, one year, is going to lead the patient into malnourishment. Okay? So this is overall, so that is going to be basically a, a, a different ages. 
metabolic disorders. So metabolic disorders. So what, how we are going to, when you have metabolic disorders, basically we are talking about the metabolism of nutrients and, and, and all the elements. So one of the problems of metabolic disorders will be the thyroid gland. Thyroid gland. Thyroid gland. Thyroid gland is the one who produced T3 and T4. We already know that this is the review. The thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is produced the T3 and T4. T3 and T4. The T3 and T4, what is the function? Is to produce ATPs. ATPs. And why do you need ATPs? To do your activities, right? So thyroid gland problem. Could be hypothyroidism, could be hyperthyroidism. Do you know somebody with hypo hyper? Yes? No? No. No? Yes. Yes? So that is a metabolic disorder. Think about it. So you have a metabolic disorder. Another problem, a metabolic disorder uh, will be, for example, gallstones. Gallstones. Stones on the, on the, on the gallbladder. Right? So basically, the stones of the gallbladder is composed by cholesterol. Very common mistake that do you think it is calcium? It's not. So the gallstones basically are cholesterol. Cholesterol. Cholesterol is like a rock, basically. Cholesterol texture is going to be, like I told you before, like the gum you find under the table. A stick on that. So that texture and that hardening is actually similar to cholesterol. Gallstones is a metabolic disorder of the metabolism of the cholesterol. Kidney stones. Kidney stones. Kidney stones are going to be the alteration of the metabolism of calcium. Too much calcium. And these metabolic disorders, tell me, so do you know somebody with gallstones? Yes. Uh, tell me, the, how old is, is, a, is, a, is a kid or is an adult or is an elderly person? Uh, it was my sister. She's in her 30s. Adult, right? Yes. Somebody ha, has a, a no, somebody, no, don't, you don't need to tell me your sister. <laughs> I don't want to go on that, but just to illustrate this, okay? So kidney stones, do you know, somebody know somebody with kidney stones? Yes. And that person is a children, is a kid, or is a very old, or is a mid-age? Middle age. Mid-age. Adult. Do you know somebody with thyroid problems, right? That thyroid problem, that person with thyroid problem, what old, how old is that? Is middle age, young, or elderly? Elderly. Early, okay, that happened. So since when she has the problem? Long time ago? Yeah, long time ago. So that are going to appear in the adult age. Yes or no? Yes. Right? So yeah. you can see the metabolic disorders mostly happen in the middle age. Oh, I will put it basically more easy, adult. We can differentiate between adults, children, and elderly. Okay, you okay with that? Yes. Yes. Okay, so if you see somebody coming to the hospital or something, they are going to be basically, uh, especially those are outpatients. There are um, emergency, we have gallstones, we can have kidney stones, it's not that common. Thyroid problems is mostly outpatient, but in that age, the, the, the problem most commonly happen are the metabolic disorders metabolic disorders is that clear so you have kids so if you have some kid coming to the room infections if you have somebody middle age metabolic disorders and then when you have some patient who is very uh, very old elderly patient the most common will be for example degenerative dis diseases like for example cancers like atherosclerosis like dementia is that dementia is the degeneration of the brain, right? Cancers is the degeneration of a tissue, cancer. So when you uh, see patients who are older, uh, elderly person, and coming to the office, most likely having some problems. So you need to check, you direct your question. You lost weight, are you feeling, you feel weak, are you having bleeding or something? So. So you need to direct your clinic, your clinical history. 
immune disorders. Immune disorders basically uh, can happen. Immune disorders, uh, we have the autoimmune disorders, for example, autoimmune disorders, autoimmune disorders. Autoimmune disorders are those uh, immune system is attacking your own body. You will understand that today. That is partially we talk in bioscience, but we are going to make, uh, we are going to see the continuation of that today. Autoimmune disorders means that your body destroys your own body. Okay? Autoimmune disorders. These autoimmune disorders will be, for example, uh, lupus. Do you know somebody with lupus? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, do you know somebody with psoriasis? Yes. Okay. Do you know somebody with, let's see, another, uh, rheumatoid arthritis? Rheumatoid arthritis? Yes. Right? Tell me, rheumatoid arthritis is male or female? Female. Psoriasis is male or female? Female. Both. Okay. Lupus. The patient you saw is female or male? Female. Oh, yeah. Female. So basically, autoimmune disorders are going to be most commonly happen in female than male. It's going to be in the range of four to one. So for four female, doesn't mean that male doesn't have lupus, psoriasis, or RA, Crohn's disease, celiac disease. So we have many other problems. Very many, many, many more, dozens of more. And the, the rate will be four to one. So it's most commonly happen our immune disorders in female than male. Okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so talking about neoplasm. So uh, in conclusion, you can you can tell who is most common in, in children, adult, or elderly. Who is most common in male or female? See how guy how is going to guide you that it's going to start to focus and center and to narrow the whole book of a med search. We got it? Okay. Talking about neoplasm. Neoplasm, please, this is something that we need to be very careful on that. So we have one word that is called neoplasia. Neoplasia. And the other word is neoplasm. Neoplasm. Okay? Neoplasia, neoplasma. Neoplasia is a word that you use when you are talking about cancers. Cancers. Okay? Neoplasm, neoplasm are going to be a, this growth that are going to be uh, benign, can be benign or can be malignant. We don't know. If this is already malignant, we don't call neoplasma, we call neoplasia. Now. But there is a moment that you don't know what it is, this growth. So you cannot call this cancer. It's a mass, yes, but you cannot call it cancer. Okay? All right. So when you talk about neoplasia and you have a growth of a tissue, that is most what we call tumor. Tumor. When you set a tumor, most likely you are talking that you are suspecting or is already being diagnosed as cancer. But when you talk about, when you are talking about uh, benign, most likely is going to, when you talk about, I will say, neoplasm, you're talking about the growth is going to be called as mass, as a mass. You have a mass. This mass, you don't know if this is benign or malignant. So mass or neoplasm. So you don't know if this is benign or malignant. So how do you make a diagnosis of, uh, of cancer? You can make a diagnosis with cancer with X-ray, CT scan, or MRI of ultrasound. What is the definitive diagnosis for a cancer? X-ray, ultrasound, MRI, CT scan, PET. What do you think? A biopsy. Do you, who said that? Me, Jessica. Jessica, excellent. So none of these imaging tools, X-ray, CT scan, ultrasound, MRI, etc., 
they are not going to make a diagnosis of cancer. They are not. They are not doing diagnosis. The diagnosis, the ultimate diagnosis will be done by biopsy. Biopsy, by histological, histopathological study of the, of the cells. That is the, actually, uh, the diagnosis of cancer. Okay, so when you see an image, image, and you see something growing there, that is called a mass. It's a neoplasm. So we don't know if it's benign or malignant. So we need to make a biopsy. And when you have a, a biopsy, it becomes benign. You can call a mass. It's a benign mass. But if you have a tumor, uh, I mean, it's malignant cancer, you will call that a tumor. Is that clear or not? Yes. Yes. So you will, in the facilities, especially in the clinicals, you will find this uh, uh, terminology. They are going to use neoplasm and neoplasia. Neoplasm and neoplasia. So in conclusion, neoplasm, I will say, is something that is uh, not being determined yet. So we don't know yet. It's still in a study. You say cancer or neoplasia, that is already a tumor. You can call tumor, tumor, it's a tumor. For example, you have ultrasound of, the, of your, uh, of your what? Of your ovaries, your brain and something. And you see a cyst. They call a cystic mass. They don't call a cystic tumor. Because if you hear cystic tumor, that means cancer of the ovary. Cystic mass. So that is basically benign. We okay with that? Yes. Okay. yes. All right. Psychiatric disorders. Psychiatric disorders. There is a, there is a lot of things to talk about that. We have anxiety disorders and mood disorders. Mood disorders. We have obsessive compulsive disorders, schizophrenia, depression. So most commonly, what do you see in in the patients? Uh, what what is the most common psychiatric problem here? So, depression, no. Yes. Depression, right? Depression is one of the top, top situations that you're going to find in people. And we are going to identify what is the, in the past, depression was happening in adult people. Nowadays, they happen at any age. 10 years old already can be depressed. Yes, it's depression. So, depression can be all over. And uh, we will talk about another time. Psychiatric can pass, can happen at any age, basically. Okay? All right, so what time is it? 10.41. Okay, so in 10 minutes, we have uh, some break. Oh, you turn. Okay. A study of the disease. Okay, so one thing. What is the study of the disease? The study of the disease is called pathology. Pathology. Pathology is the, uh, the science that study the disease. So what is study the pathology? The pathology, you're going to start with a definition, just to let you know all the process. It's not like just one word. You start the definition. You're going to start checking what are the risk factors what are the causes, the etiology, etiology, etiology is study the, of the causes. You're going to uh, check the laboratory test. You're going to check the signs and symptoms. You're going to check the, um, the uh, uh, differential diagnosis. You're going to check the uh, prognosis. You're going to see the treatment. See, all these steps is pathology. Do I need to, do you need to know that? No. So no in that order at all. But definitely pathology is a study of disease. It's just to make it simple. You have a problem. You want to know everything about the problem. You want to be the most gossip, gossip person you can be. So you want details. So when it's happening, how is that happening? What is going to happen? So what? When, where, how, who, what, right? So all these actually the study of the pathology in just a very simple way. Okay, so let's talk about the disease of uh, terminology. So what is pathology? Pathology is the study of the disease. 
you can be as gossip, you can gossip as much as you can. Okay, so you try to uh, understand what is the cause, etc., etc. Okay, this is terminology. So now is where you're going to have a frame of how to determine if this pathology is or this disease is chronic or is acute. Chronic or acute. And we'll talk about a little bit about subacute. Subacute. So now, uh, what is happening here is this. We have a time frame. This time, the cutoff in the majority of the diseases is three months. Three months. So that means two months and 31 days. So three months, okay? Three months. Less than three months is going to be something, and more than three months is going to be something else. Okay. When the pathology, when the disease is with you for three months or less, that means that is acute. When it's more than three months, when it's more than three months, that is going to be a chronic disease. Example, tell me, uh, we'll see, uh, hypertension. Hypertension is a chronic or acute? Chronic. 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 Okay. And no, diabetes mellitus is acute or chronic? Chronic. 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 HIV is acute or chronic? Chronic. 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 Tell me, how many of you have a back pain, right? Don't, don't tell me, but how many of you have back pain? Okay? Tell me, that back pain, how long is, is last? Last? Less than three months or more than three months? More than three months. If that is more than three months, that is a chronic condition. If that is less than three months, it's going to be an acute condition. So if you have somebody who's having back pain consecutively, repetitive, once every week, every two weeks, every three weeks, and for at least three months or more, that is a chronic condition. We got it? Yes. 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 Excellent. So, and what is subacute? Subacute is when they get closer to be chronic. So it's going to be the last days, one month, so between two to three months, that is called subacute. We don't use that commonly, but that is we use in order to tell that this is persistent disease that is leading into a chronic disease. That's all. But the most common that we use are acute and chronic. Acute and chronic. Another that is that is uh, I would say is uh, not the rule in this case is going to be hepatitis. Hepatitis. Hepatitis B, for example, hepatitis B. Hepatitis B is going to last, the acute form is going to last for six months. Six months. Six months. If the hepatitis B lasts more than six months, that is considered chronic. But this is one of the exemptions. Are you okay with that? Yes. Yes. Okay. So now, the other, so all the heads, can you use money? All the heads, huh? Don't tell me I didn't tell you. Okay. So a study of the, uh, uh, all right, so what is the uh, incidence, prevalence, and mortality rate? All right, so epidemiology. What is the epidemiology? Epidemiology is the study of the disease in the population. So what does it mean? For example, you are in one person. You are one person. You are one person. And then you have a cold. Uh, you have a cold. So I study how is the cold on you. Fever, uh, uh, actually aches, uh, sneezing, congestion, etc. right? So that is one, one patient study. So I study one patient one. But what about if I put together all many people who have been cold at the same, uh, at the same time or cold in that uh, area, for example, your classroom, I, all of you are having cold. So instead to make data of one by one, I'm going to make a data from the whole group. So in the whole group, how is the temperature? In the whole group, how is this, how is the congestion? In the whole group, how are going to be the smell, anosmia, or, or et cetera, right? So muscle ache. So I study the same one disease in a group of people. That is called the epidemiology. Epidemiology is, that this, is the study of the disease in the population. Is that clear? 
Yes. 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 Okay. Now, for that, we need to know some terminology that you're going to see when you're reading journals, when you're reading some books, you're going to find these words. Incidence, prevalence, mortality rate. Incidence. Incidence and prevalence. What is incidence? Incidence, please write it down. Incidence is the number of, num the, uh, the, uh, number of new cases of new cases in uh, in one year. That is incidence. Incidence in just remember in like one, like I one one. So is the number of new cases in one year. For example, HIV. We have fifty thousand new cases every year. So fifty new cases of HIV. For diabetes mellitus, we have 1,200,000 new cases every year in the United States. Okay? Now, uh, uh, let's see. All right, so that is incident. What is incident? The number of new cases in a year. So what is prevalence? Prevalence, P past, right? P past. So that means that that are the, the, number, of, the number of new cases plus the old cases. So overall, so that is prevalence, prevalence, prevalence. We okay with that? Yes. yes no. So prevalence and incidence are not the same. Incidence are the number of cases, the number of new cases in one year. Prevalence will be the number of the new cases plus the old cases in the past. Okay. So, for example, in COVID-19, I don't have in the top of the numbers, but the COVID-19, the incidence will be the number of cases, the number of new cases in one year. And prevalence is the total number of cases that you uh, people have, not in one year, but in all these one, two, three, four years. Okay? Okay. All right, so let's talk about... It's 10.50. Oh, sorry? Break time. Break time, okay. Uh, let me go here, just a moment. It's 10.50, so let's do a, a, at 11.2, 11, 11.3. 11, yes, okay. 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 Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.
Hello. Hello. Oh, no. Hi. My glasses are going to get broken. Uh. Oh my God. These glasses are very expensive. It's not about the prices. About the time that is taken to replace, to wait, and all that. Anyhow, all right. So let's. Start. All right. So let's continue. Okay. So here we have uh, what we call the communicable communicable diseases. All right, so talking about communicable diseases. Enjoy ad-free oh listening of 75 happened? million songs on your Echo device. Oh New subscribers get 30 oh. days free. Free news automatically for only $3.99 per month. Alexa, stop. Just ask Alexa, try Amazon Music Alexa is crazy sometimes. Okay. All right, so communicable disease, uh, that doesn't mean that you are going to, oh, somebody is sick. No. Communicable disease is the way that the diseases are being transmitted. You okay with that? Yes. Yes. So the way they're going to be transmitted is going to be through different routes. So how you can get the uh, disease into your uh, into your body? We are going to go back to these slides in a few moments. But we have the portals portals of entry. The portals of entry are the uh, areas where the disease or I mean the bacteria, virus, or whatever is going to get into your body. So first of all, a skin, the skin. The skin is going to be the first barrier, the first line of defense. So that is, if you have a disruption of the skin, disruption of the skin, the bacteria can go in. You okay with that? So that is a portal of entry and exit. Question for exam, respiratory tract. So everything that you inhale or exhale, so everything that you inhale can produce dust, can be viruses, can be bacteria, can be etc. Digestive system, everything that you eat. So tell me, when you have a candy on the floor, you count one, two, three, four, five, and eat it? Yes or no? No. No, of course not. Already, when they touch down, the when they touch, they touch the floor, it's already like uh, thousands and thousands of bacteria getting on board. All right, so you cannot do that. So now, the digestive system, for example, uh, you have um, the depends of the, uh, for example, if you eat something that is contaminated with bacteria, and you will, uh, that can produce the gastric acid. The gastric acid is acid, and bacteria hate acid. Remember that? So one of the defenses of the body is the gastric acid. So you even take some food that is having some contamination, some bacteria, the, the gastric acid will destroy the bacteria. But there is a limit. So you cannot put, it's different to put 10 bacteria that the gastric acid will destroy that versus 1 million bacteria. So the stomach probably will kill most of them, but some of them will be able to still go into the, to the body and that can produce an infection. So in that case, what we are talking is about the dose of the bacteria, the dose of the bacteria. The body basically can handle a, a low number of, of few number of these bacteria, but when they are in, in, in very big amount, the body cannot help anymore and the bacteria is going to break the barrier and they go to the 
and produce that disease. Digestive system. The urinary system and reproductive system, the urinary system, the UTI, urinary tract infections, right? When we will talk about kidneys, uh, you will say, why is bad to retain urine? So we will talk about that another time. So, so portal of entry, skin, the lungs, gastrointestinal, urinary and reproductive organs. If, if you see all these are openings, right? The skin, a skin opening of the skin can produce this. Respiratory tract, digestive system, urinary and reproductive organs. You okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So now we have the treatment of prevention of diseases. So first of all, I want to, uh, who, when I talk about communicable disease, communicable disease is how the disease was transmitted to the person. So for example, uh, airway, right? So COVID-19. COVID-19 are going to be for the respiratory, respiratory tract the droplets, the airborne, are going to be containing these viruses. Uh, for example, another pathway will be the eyes, the eyes, the mucosa of the eyes. So if the virus or bacteria get into your eye, they can get into your body, inside. So it's the portal of entry. So that's why we use facial facial shields, or no? Yes or no? Yes. So why, why do you think we're using facial shields? To look good or fashionable or what? No, there's a reason, All right? Or because everybody's doing the same? No, it's because that is a portal of entry for the bacteria. We okay with that? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. So uh, now uh, we are going to talk about diagnosis, symptoms, signs, and syndrome. So this is very important to really understand what we are talking about. That is the main thing. So in, in fundamentals, when you are doing the, uh, the objective, objective data, data or subjective data, so what is subjective? What is objective? You know already? Give me one example of objective data. Vital signs. Vital sign. Give me one example of, of subjective data. Pain. 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 So that is basically what I want you to remember. Look at this. We have here, uh, we have here uh, signs and symptoms. Signs plus symptoms. Oh, by the way, before I forgot, I forgot from the previous one. So let's, let's skip for a moment. Tell me one thing, a, a scenario, a scenario. You go to the hospital, okay? You go to the hospital and you have one doctor, one doctor who is see you and the doctor is going to ask one laboratory test, one laboratory test, okay? That is situation A. The situation B, you go to the same hospital, but you've been seen by a different doctor and the doctor this time is going to ask you, 10 laboratory tests. So if you want to repeat it again, which doctor you will select? Dr. A or with one lab laboratory test or Dr. B with 10 laboratory tests? A. Ah? A. A. Somebody else? A. A. Somebody else? 10 or 1? B. One. B. B, right? Ten laboratory tests. I'm going to ask you why, so you need to give me a reason. Okay, what else? Somebody, we have 23, I have only five saying something. Please, please, please. B. B. B, A. Please, uh, if you don't participate, that is, I'm going to read the slides. Yeah, because I don't know how how you're going, to, you're reacting. So I'm going to read the slides. Diagnosis, identification of the nature of the illness, symptoms, subjective evidence, signs, objective evidence, syndrome, prognosis, therapy. <laughs> okay. All right. So very good. You understood? Excellent. Let's go up to the next slide. 
No. <laughs> Please don't do that. Yeah. So that's what I mean. Well, that's what I mean. You want me to do that? I don't want to do that. But I want, I need the participation of everybody. Please. I'm not going to do please anymore because definitely it's not, at the end, it's your benefit. Okay. All right. So the answer will be, I'm going to give you the answer next time. I'm not going to give the answer because nobody. No, no. That's right. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. So please participation. Okay. So I will select between one laboratory, laboratory, 10 laboratory tests. I will select the one who asks only for one laboratory test. Only one. Only one. The less laboratory tests. Why? Why is that? Why? Because Dr. A have a very good idea of what is going on. So the doctor needs only one laboratory test to confirm the diagnosis. To confirm. And that is the purpose of the laboratory test. You, you are the suspicious of the, the suspicious based on the assessment of the patient. And the laboratory test is just to confirm what the, the doctor is thinking. But if you go to Dr. B, the Dr. B is asking 10 laboratory tests. 10 laboratory tests. Why? Because the doctor doesn't have any idea what is going on with you. And, uh, and the doctor is, is expecting that the laboratory tests are going to give him the diagnosis. And that is not the right thing. The right thing is, the right thing is to uh, actually, when the laboratory tests are for that, to confirm a diagnosis, a suspicious. Okay, we okay, we okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right, so you know now which doctor you can go, okay? Signs and symptoms. Signs, sign. So, for example, a sign is, uh, for example, 65 miles per hour. That is a sign or not? Yes. So, how you measure that? You do the velocity, right? Velocity, you can measure uh, 55, 60, 60 miles per, per, per hour, 65 miles per hour. That is the maximum, right? Sign. Sign everything that is measurable, measurable, measurable. Everything that you can measure, the weight, the temperature, you can, uh, the volume, uh, the, the size. So everything that you can measure is a sign. Now, a symptom is everything that you cannot, is cannot be measured. cannot be measured, cannot be measured. Measurable, we have, for example, the viral signs, viral signs. So that's why it's called viral. Viral means why? But because this viral data is telling you that you are alive. Viral means alive. Signs that you can measure. What you can measure? The blood pressure. You can measure blood pressure, yes. You can measure the respiratory rate. Can you measure the heart rate? Can you measure the temperature? Yes, those are vital signs, measurable. In conclusion, those are the objective data, objective. You okay with that? Yes. Yes. Now, the, you, when you cannot measure, it's going to be subjective. Is going to be subjective. Subjective. Subjective will be, as you, some of you said already, pain. 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 So pain, but tell me, but pain I can measure from 1 to 10 or not? Yes. yes. So that is making the pain measurable, objective, 1 to 10? Okay, no. So one to ten is uh, in, is intended intend to make uh, uh, some measurement, but it's not objective. Why? Because the threshold that means how much pain you can stand 
is different from person to person. And that is already subjective. For example, if I, so for some people, pain five, one is no pain, uh, less pain, 10 is my, a lot of pain, 10, a lot of pain. You said five, five, that pain five for that person, probably for another person will be eight or nine, more sensitive for the pain. During the menstrual cycle, you know, the, the menstrual cycle, I will teach you someday soon, the menstrual cycle, female are more sensitive to pain during the ovulation. You're more sensitive for pain during ovulation, right? So, and now to compare between female and male, female stand more the pain than male. Female stand more the pain than male. So why is that? I don't know. Probably God made us like for delivery babies. Okay, thanks God we don't deliver babies. Yes, <laughs> women, right? Because it's I know that it's a lot of pain, right? Pain, right? It's a pleasure too, but it's a pain, pain. Okay, so that is subjective. So even though one to ten is an int intent to make it uh, quantitative, is not. Is not objective. Is subjective. Is that clear or not? Yes. Yes. Yep. Tell me, nauseous is 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 uh, is symptom or sign? Symptom. 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 Can you pretend that you you cannot measure the nauseous? Vomit is a sign or is a symptom? Sign. 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 Diarrhea is a sign or symptom? Fine. Fine. Okay, so those are actually what you need to remember. So when they are telling you subjective or objective data, you are talking about objective, about science, everything that you can measure. Subjective is going to be everything that is uh, not measurable. You okay with that? Yes. 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 So now... You need to apply this for your fundamentals, okay? Then we have uh, what a syndrome. Syndrome. What is a syndrome? What is a syndrome? Sign and symptom. Exactly. Together. It's the sign plus the symptom. That is a syndrome. Example of syndrome. Example of syndrome. We have the febrile syndrome. Febrile syndrome. What is a febrile syndrome? Febrile syndrome, febrile, febrile coming from fever. So fever itself is a sign, yes or no? Yes. Yes. Right? But tell me, when you have fever, you're happy? Oh, God, I have fever. Yeah, I have fever. You, you do that? No, right? When you have fever, you feel, you feel tired or no? Yes. 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 You feel pain on your eyes. Yes, and weakness. And those are sensations. Those are subjective. You cannot, you cannot as uh, measure the pain. Okay. So in this, we have fever plus pain. For example, we have retroocular pain. So uh, uh, pain be behind the eyes. For example. So, febrile syndrome. So, what is a syndrome? Is the collection of signs and symptoms. You okay with that? Yes. All right, another one. The pain syndrome. Pain syndrome. Pain is a, is a sign or symptom? Symptom. Symptom. But why is called pain syndrome? Pain syndrome is this. Look at this. You know, with the time, another time I'm going to teach you, you know you can detect some when somebody is faking pain? Or no? It's very difficult sometimes, right? Because there are very good uh, actors there. Yes or no? Or actresses, whatever. Right? So how you can detect the, pain, the patient is faking pain? So... 
And this is kind of common. You know why? Because there is people who use opioids, morphine. Morphine. And they go to the hospital pretending that they have pain in order to receive the narcotic. You got it? All right, so that is another time. But basically, I'm going to tell you what is a pain syndrome. When you have pain, when you have pain, you say, oh my God, good, I have pain. You say that or no? No. no. You're happy to have pain? No. No, right? So when you are in pain, are you in rest and digest or fight or flight? Fight or flight. Fight or flight. Fight or flight. Fight or flight. If you are having fight or flight, what you're going to release? The adrenaline. If you release adrenaline, the adrenaline activates the receptors for adrenaline. And when you activate the receptor for adrenaline, will be the alpha-1, for example, that produce the vasoconstriction. And that lead into high blood pressure they can activate the beta-1. The beta-1 are going to increase the heart rate. So when you have pain and you have this fight or flight, your blood pressure go up, your respiratory rate go up, your pulse, the heart rate go up. Temperature can go up, it's not that heavy, but it can go up. In addition to that, remember the midriasis, midriasis or not? Yes. You feel. Yeah, midriasis. That is fight or flight. So all these are companion with the pain. You got pain and the blood pressure is high. Take the blood pressure, it's high. You have pain, you have the heart rate, the respiratory rate go up. Your eyes, the people are dilated because you are fight or flight. You want to escape, you run, whatever. Pain syndrome. Okay with that? Yes. 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 Okay. And what is a disease? A disease are the collection of syndromes. That is how B is organized. And that is leading into the diagnosis. Into the diagnosis. Okay? So simple, right? So now you, for the first, I mean, at least in my course, for the first time you are getting into how a nurse need to address the data. Data or data. I don't know, data or data. Data I like because it's a Star, a star Trek. I like it. Well, anyhow. Data, the, the data. We okay with that? Yes. 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 All right, so tell me the time, please, about what time is it? 11.28. Okay, so we have half an hour. All right, so here we have, uh, we are going to talk about bacteria. And the bacteria, you see here MRSA. So that is a review from Bioscience. So we have MRSA. MRSA is the methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. What you see here are coccus. Coccus Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus. And these staphylococcus are gram-positive, gram-positive. How to remember gram-positive? Heaven and Exactly, heaven versus, heaven versus hell, right? Uh, okay. We have gram-positive, gram-positive, and they are going to be gram negative. Gram negative. So if you remember, gram positive are going to be positive, blue, going to heaven. Gram negative, red, fire, you go to hell, negative, down. Okay, so don't forget that. It's coming for the exam. Gram positive will be red or pinkish. The gram, ne the, the gram negative. The gram positive go to heaven, right? It's going to be blue. 
blue or purple. In this case, you see a purple or blue that is the Staphylococcus. That is coccus because it's rounded and they are going to create clusters. Clusters. That is how you identify this is Staphylococcus aureus. Staphylococcus aureus. Here we have coccus here, gram positive, again, blue, but the, the configuration or the organization will be as a, as a, as a necklace, like a line. So different from the clusters of the Staphylococcus. So that is what we call the Streptococcus. 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 Here we have, we have, uh, we have here a coccus, but this actually you see here there are going to be one, two, one, two, one, two, uh, one, two, no, one, two, sorry. So always they are going to be companion, one and two. Here is not see very well. So we have that is what you call the diplococcus, diplo or diplococcus, and that is happening in the uh, gonorrhea. That is the gonorrhea. And the gonorrhea is a gram negative because you see the stain, the gram stain is red. Okay? Here we have the Clostridium difficile. Clostridium difficile. Clostridium difficile that we learned that is happening with the, uh, is going to be the endospore and the sporulation. If you don't know that, I'm going to ask that. And you must review that for the for the next exam. Okay, so this is review. This should be known already. And the question difficile, if you see here, is going to be blue. It's going to be blue. This these are blue. These are blue. This is the is actually the clostridium. It's blue. So that is a gram positive. Gram positive. This, these guys are, this is the pseudomona. Pseudomona, pseudomona, you hear, somebody hear about pseudomona? Somebody, tell me. No, no. Pseudomona aureginos, that is uh, actually a gram negative. And this basically happened in patients with diabetes mellitus. If you see the lesion here, this is very, is uh, you need to you're going to see that because you need to recognize earlier because when you have pseudomonas regular antibiotics are not going to be effective if you yeah, wait for the diagnosis later it's going to be too late yes what are those gangrenes are those what sorry dear gangrenes gangrene no 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 that is the clostridium perfringens that is a different one this is the pseudomona, mostly happening in diabetic patients. And what I want just to show you, perfringes, you see black. That is the gangrene. Perfringes, clostridium perfringes is the black, giving black. This is pseudomona, it's different. The pseudomona is going to give you the characteristic lesion with bluish, greenish, with full smell. So that is pseudomona, that is gram negative, mostly happening in diabetes mellitus. Even though that you, I know that you're going to forget pseudomonas, you know what I mentioned, why? Because at least in the future we'll say, oh, I heard that. But if you remember pseudomonas, I give you a star. Excellent, thank you so much. All right, so let's talk about the uh, microbiology study of microorganisms, and we are going to, uh, talk very much about the normal flora. We have the microbiology, the study of organisms. We have bacteria, is the bacteriology question. For example, virus, study by the virology. Fungi, mycology, is not fungology. <laughs> is fungi means my, uh, is mycology. Protozoa is protozoology. Algae, we don't we need to talk about algae, so I don't know, it's, it's okay. So those are, um, uh, for example, parasites are going to be studied by the parasitology, parasitology. So normal flora. Normal flora, this is again a review for you guys. If this is the second chance and the last in order to remember what is the flora. 
So don't take the extra mile. You like to take the extra mile. Okay, otherwise it's going to just go one ear and go to the other ear. And that is so many questions for NCLEX coming based on the flora. If you don't know the base of flora, you will have very much difficulties to do an exam. One, by the way, I want to tell you one thing. You need to know very well your nursing process. Why? Because, you know, the first step is the assessment, then the nursing diagnosis, then the planification with the outcome, then the interventions, and then the uh, evaluation. Right? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. So now, listen to this very careful. Questions for NCLEX and HESI. Questions for HESI and, N uh, HESI and NCLEX. There are going to be many questions that are going to be like this. The question is related to assessment. And the answers should be an intervention. If the question is talking about an intervention, your answer will be an assessment. So you need to practice now on to identify what are the parts of the assessment. Assessment will be the clinical history, present and past, laboratory test, viral signs and the physical exam. Then you go to the diagnosis. Then you're going to see what are your plan, what are your goals, and then the interventions. So if you know the process, you will have, it's going to be much more easy to answer questions, to identify. Why? Because when they give you uh, in the question an assessment, if you see some assessment on the options, that most likely is not the answer. See how much you can elaborate now? We got it? And those are tips how to take exams. And I'm going to give you the tips bit by bit. I don't want to burn you at this moment. Just slowly, slowly. Okay? We got it? Yes. Okay. So where we are? Oh. Flora. Okay, the Flora. Flora. All right, so open your eyes very much. Flora, Flora is basically, we have this column. Okay, so we have the ascending column, ascending column, the transverse column, and the descending column. In this flora, what is a flora? Flora means the bacteria population. Bacterial or bacteria population. Or population of bacteria, okay? The bacteria population, bacteria population, bacteria population. So this population, listen to this, think about people. Think about people, they live in this ge geographical area. In this area, they are going to leave bacteria that they are going to have 400 different species. It's, let's make it like a jungle. In the jungle, we have many animals. In the jungle, we have not only one type of, of animal, we have different type of animals. And each animal have their own population. You okay with that? Yes. yes. So we have 400 different, 400 different, uh, what, uh, species. So the red is representing one species. I'm going to take my time because I want you to elaborate. So I, it's all the column, okay? Then we have another type of pieces, species. Uh, See, it's going to be different species, different population, each species with population. Another, for example, will be uh, this guy. 
So we have, in this case, we have 400 different species, and we have millions and millions from each species. Millions and millions of species. So we have so many, so much population here. Okay, perfect. That's enough. All right, so now we have 400 different species that are living in this geographical area, in this column. So that means that these uh, species of bacteria are going to be under competition. They are going to compete between them. They're, this competition are going to, they are going to compete for space and for food. It's like an ecosystem in the forest. The ecosystem reaches their balance. And when the ecosystem in the forest reaches their balance, there is not too many wolves versus too many, too many deer. It's going to be always in balance. Right? We okay with that? Yes. Yes. So all these 400 different species of bacteria are going to be under control, like in the in the forest. Right? And they are going to have, they are going to control. One species of bacteria said, okay, so I need a space and food for me. All right, so somebody wants to do invade your area, they are not going to allow. It. So always the number of population per species are going to be similar. So there is no invasion. So they are always going to be in low number per species. You okay with that? Yes. yes. So the bacteria, bacteria is called the good bacteria because produce no disease. Why do not produce disease? Why? Because is the population is low, it's under control. And the bacteria, what they're going to do is to produce, synthesize, you already know what is synthesize because we talked about it in the past. Synthesize means production, produce the vitamin K. Vitamin K. Okay? The vitamin K. So what is the vitamin K? Open eyes, open ears, please. The vitamin K is going to be the coagulation vitamin. Coagulation vitamin. So where is going to participate this? Here we have the liver. This is the liver, and you know the coagulation factors, the A, B, C, remember? Right? The C, the coagulation factor. Coagulation factors are proteins. Are going to be 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. That is the fibrin. Is the fibrin. So these are going to have chemical reactions. So in order to obtain fibrin, they have they need to pass through the, all the cascade of reactions. These reactions they need enzymes. And these enzymes are going to need coenzymes, bioscience, coenzyme. This coenzyme is going to cooperate with the enzyme. So the vitamin K is a coenzyme that is going to cooperate with a chemical reaction to obtain fibrin. So uh, here we have the vitamin K participate in the chemical reaction. If you don't have vitamin K, what happens? You don't produce fibrin. If you don't produce fibrin, you cannot produce coagulation. If you don't produce coagulation, you have risk for bleeding. See how is the sequence? One scene after another. We okay with that? Yes. 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 Okay. So the normal flora, the flora are going to be basically the food of the food, the food for the bacteria will be what? Because this is a process called symbiosis. A symbiotic relationship. Like this relationship, LT, okay. <laughs> Relation R L T. <laughs> right? Symbiotic relationship or called symbiosis. 
symbiosis. What is symbiosis or symbiotic relationship? Is the mutual cooperation. So the bacteria is helping us and we help the bacteria. We help the bacteria how? To give him, him food. What is the food of the bacteria? What is the food of this bacteria? Fiber. Fiber. F food, F fiber. And what is fiber? Cellulose. Yes. And what is cellulose? A carbohydrate. What kind of carbohydrate? A polysaccharide. That is not new. So that's why we have a lot of material to go over. So this is something that we must know already. Okay? All right. So, and the flora, the flora is helping in order to prevent the proliferation of bad bacteria. If you have a bad bacteria coming, so versus we have so many good bacteria, that the good bacteria basically is going to get rid of the bad bacteria. The bad bacteria is going to enter into few uh, number, few number, in, uh, and, uh, and we have the good bacteria is in big number who can kick out the bad bacteria. Now, the importance about this is that Clostridium difficile, Clostridium difficile, the Clostridium difficile. Clostridium difficile, Clostridium difficile is a bacteria that is gram positive, that is living in the, in the colon. But only 15% of the whole population contain Clostridium difficile as part of the normal flora. Clostridium difficile is bad when it's alone. But when you have Clostridium difficile, part of the, of the flora is because his population, its population is under control. There are not so much, not so many. The problem is when you are taking some antibiotics to kill bacteria because you have some infection, whatever infection you are having, you're taking antibiotics. The antibiotics are going to kill the, the bacteria who produce the disease. But they do not discriminate. This antibiotic will not be able to differentiate between the bad bacteria versus the flora. So what is doing the flora? The flora starts to go down. Why? Because the antibiotic is killing the normal flora, the good bacteria. But the only ones who are not going to be killed are going to be that Clostridium difficile. Why? Review your bioscience. We were talking about the endospore and the process called the esporulation. 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 This esporulation is going to encapsulate the bacteria when some uh, danger is coming. The danger here is the antibiotic. So the, the Clostridium difficile is going to hide in the capsule endospore and meantime, the antibiotic is killing the rest of the bacteria. So when the anti you're not going to take antibiotic for the rest of your life, you stop the antibiotic. So there is no more antibiotic, but the flora is sweep out completely, except the Clostridium difficile that was hiding under a capsule. They call the sporulation. Then they are going to uh, open and say, "Oh my God, nobody is here." All the space is mine now. All the food is mine now. I don't have competition. So I start to do, I reproduce like crazy. I reproduce, 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 reproduce in so big number that can lead into what we call the C. diff diarrhea. The C. diff diarrhea is caused by the bacteria who is growing in so much number that basically is going to attach to the walls of the intestine, producing an inflammation. This inflammation makes the intestine produce more peristalsis. More peristalsis means that you have less time to absorb water, so you have diarrhea. Somebody 
somebody saw CD in the, in the hospital? Yes. The smell is, uh, is uh, the smell is yellow, is many greenish and with membranes, it's right? It's horrible. Yeah. So that is so that is what happened. So the patient most likely was taking antibiotics for at least two days. For at least two days. And you start to suspect you have C. diff diarrhea when at least the patient is having four, four loose stools in that day, at least. You okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is the flora. The flora is so important, very important. So you already know I make the extra mile because we review for what we talk in bioscience. So I give you exactly the same information. Now, in addition to the flora, we have the normal flora. We have flora not only in the intestines. We have flora everywhere, everywhere. For example, your eyes, your eyes. Your eyes, they have a normal flora. They have good bacteria. So, and that is going to prevent the bad bacteria to invade you. Because the good bacteria is going to say, no, this is my place, I kick you out. So the bad bacteria cannot invade. Same, we have flora on the skin. On the skin, a skin flora. The skin flora. A skin flora. The flora of the skin. The flora of the skin. We have the flora on your mouth. In your mouth. Flora in your mouth. The flora on your nose. Flora on or inside their nose, the flora in the genital area, the mucosa, the genital area, the anal area are going to be composed by flora. And what is the purpose? Is to prevent the invasion of bad bacteria. Are you okay with that? Yes. Okay, so tell me when the time is... Okay, so I want you to see this. Look at this. This is, let's go to the normal intestine, intestine, uh, what happened? I don't like it. Oh, okay. Can you see the normal intestine? Yes. What is the large intestine? Now, that is the, you don't see the, the flora because they're not going to tell you, hi, how are you? I'm not here. Because it's a microscope, you cannot see it, right? But there is a lot of bacteria there, right? And then they are going to, when that happens, the antibiotic and killing the bacteria, the endospore, the sporulation of the crustium difficile. Look at that. That is the proliferation of this Clostridium difficile, the CD. You okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, so let's talk about the the uh, how how we we are going to recognize. So, guess, so I'm going to make a break in seven minutes. Okay? okay. Okay. So for the exam and for your practice and what you're is going to be useful for you, uh, you need to know just just to have uh, an idea that there is different shapes of bacteria. So please, this is important. Okay. So the conclusion is what is really important. So, but I need to explain you things. Cosine means round, like cocos, like coconuts, round. Bacilli, like a capsule, right? Are going to be like rods. Vibrium, like a comma, comma, like a comma. When you put a comma in your writing, that, that is the shape of some bacteria. Espirilla, espirilla is going to be like uh, like, uh, like uh, a spirillum, like, <laughs> Like, a, there you are, a cork, a screw, like that. Spiroquetas are going to be this long wave-like, not like, like totally like a cork screw. So there is different shapes of bacteria, different shape of bacteria. So for this, you need to remember we have this blue and red, blue and red. Blue means positive or negative. Gram, uh, gram positive or gram yeah. negative? Positive. Positive. And the red, the hell, the evil, the fire, burning, is the gram? 
negative. 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 Okay. So that is important. Why do you need to know that? Oh, you know, I don't need to do this because I don't, I'm not going to be microscope. I'm not going to be in the laboratory. It's just general, general information that is going to create secure, sec, you're going to feel, create self-confidence in whatever topic you're talk, talking somewhere. But this is very related because you will hear many times about this. All right, so Bacillus, we have all these guys. This is the E. coli. That is the E. coli. That is a gram negative. Espirillum, we have the Helicobacter pylori. This is the Helicobacter pylori. This is the one who are located in the intestine, in the stomach, sorry. And that as associated, associated with uh, ulcers. And 97% of the cases are associated with cancer of the stomach, cancer of stomach, carcinoma of the stomach. So helicobacter pylori. Helicobacter pylori is uh, sometimes asymptomatic. So when they produce symptoms, you have gastritis for two weeks. So that means that every single day of two weeks, no. So you have gastritis today, you feel better tomorrow in two days again and again, repeat it, stop one, two, three days, stop again. That same story in, three, in two weeks. That is something that you may uh, pay, uh, uh, make alert and your attention and you must go to the doctor. Any, any signs and symptoms that you have, you must go to the doctor as soon as possible. Anklets, hesi, don't wait more than two weeks. That is two weeks, that number, okay? All right. So Campylobacter jejuni is going to be diarrhea. Then we have the leptospirosis, diarrhea. Treponema pallidum, this is, where is the treponema pallidum? It, okay, it's not here. This is the treponema pallidum. Treponema pallidum is the syphilis, 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 syphilis. Vibrium cholera, diarrhea. So we already, we are going to tell you this. Look at this. The bacteria is going to be recognized and we must know the name of the bacteria, recognize the bacteria for a reason. You need, and how to recognize the, the bacteria? By the shape. So round, spirillus, coma, vibrium, whatever, shape. Number two, the color, gram positive or gram negative. And number three, number three, how they are going to get organized. Clusters will be staphylococcus, like a line, like a necklace, are going to be the streptococcus. So at the end, all what they just mentioned, why is important to know this? Why? Because we are going to recognize and identify the type of bacteria who cause the disease. So in addition, why is still important to know that? So what I, I should do with that? So I already know the name, wherever, the address, his ID, his phone number, whatever of the bacteria. I have everything. But what, what now what? The what is this? Knowing exactly who you are or who it is, we can choose the right antibiotic. We can choose the right treatment. That's why. All this stuff is because of that. You okay with that? Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is before meal. <laughs> Look at this. Before meal, after meal. What is inside your blood? This is the Rocky Mountain Rickettius. This is the ticks. Ticks. So I will teach you when it's time, when, when you take, when you can remove ticks, if you already know. Yes, you can tell. Okay, so what time is it, please? 59. 59. All right, so I will give you a 12 set, okay? Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Doc. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Hello. 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 Let's hi, continue. Dr. G. Hi, hi. Okay, so let's continue. Okay, let's finish with these uh, uh, bacteria, and uh, I'm going to just mention very uh, brief of what I want you to remember is this. Uh, some few bacteria that you need to memorize as, uh, because they are very common. One is the Escherichia coli, is the E. coli, is the E. coli. So write down that please, the E. coli. E. coli is one of the bacteria that are basically in 97% or more of the, the urinary tract infections are going to be the E. coli. E. coli is a gram negative. That's it. Okay. The majority of urinary tract infections are E. coli. E. coli. E. coli. The okay with that? Okay. Now, another thing I want to tell you is this. All surfaces, surface, for example, your, you have your uh, surface, for example, any surface, your pen, your pen tablet, your tablet, your cell phone, your glasses, your everything. And the surface mostly are leaving these guys, Staphylococcus. Staphylococcus. Those Staphylococcus are gram positive. Gram positive. Okay? So, for example, Staphylococcus will be more, the population are going to be in high number or, or close to the floor. Close to the floor. Close to the floor. So it's going to be a good idea to take the shoes out of uh, before you get into your home, for example. So if you have a backpack, the backpack, you put it on the floor. How many times you put the, the bag, your bag or the, ba the backpack on the floor? And then what happened? You go home and where you put it? In your bed, on your bed, or no? Or you put it in your desk or in the table where you eat or in the chair where you sit, right? So be careful with that, okay? Are you okay with that? Yes, thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Talking about viruses, viruses, viruses are not living organisms, right? Not living organisms. We, we okay with that? Why? Because these viruses can, that is bioscience, cannot replicate by himself. They cannot reproduce. So to consider an organism that, uh, that is a living organism, you, that organism needs to be able to multiply by themselves without any help. That is the case of the bacteria, fungus, parasites. But the viruses are not considered living organisms. Why? Because there is a piece of the DNA that is make them uh, multiply that is missing. So in other words, if you put the virus alone, alone, isolated, the virus will age and will, go, will die with uh, uh, getting older and die. So that's why the virus are going to need to invade a host, your cells in your body, COVID-19. They invade your cells and they are going to take that piece of the DNA that is missing for the replication of the virus. So that is what is making the definition of to be alive or not. So the virus are not considered a living organism. You okay with that? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Fungi. Fungi basically are going to be opportunistic infections. The fungi I want you to remember is the Candida albicans. Candida albicans. The Candida albicans, where is located? Very simple. You will, uh, uh, people who uh, uh, does, doesn't have hygiene in their mouth, or, 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 or oral uh, hygiene, you see these white areas on the top of the tongue, that white, that is Candida albicans. Candida albicans are present when the immune system is down or the bad hygiene of the patient. That Candida albicans is considered an opportunistic infection. They are, they are looking for the opportunity to invade. 
And what is the, when is that opportunity? When the immune system is down, candida albicans. That is what we call trash. You okay with that? Yes. Now, the protozoa. The protozoa, uh, just to get familiar with that, we have, for example, the amoeba. Probably you, you have, a, in the high school, you will see in the microscope amoebas, right? And the amoebas are like this. They are going to crawl. And that is a group of protozoa. We have many others. Amoebas, we have uh, uh, Clonerchis sinensis, we have Faciolasis, we have what we are going to mention is the malaria. Malaria. Malaria is a disease that is caused by a protozoa called the plasmodium. That is the only thing I want you to remember. Plasmodium. 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 Plasmodium, just to draw, is going to be something like this. That is a plasmodium. Okay, plasmodium is going to... Malaria is enclex, by the way. Enclex. Even though we don't have malaria here, but many people travel to different areas where we have uh, malaria. So there's a prophylaxis, a treatment, if that is the case. So you must know for NCLEX, plasmodium. What is plasmodium? It's a protozoa. And this pl protozoa are, uh, this plasmodium produce malaria. Malaria. You okay with that? Yes. 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 All right, so parasitic, uh, uh, parasitic worms. Worms. We have different worms, Ancidostoma, Strongyloides, uh, uh, Oxyurus, uh, Ascaris, Lumbricoids, uh, uh, etc. Many, many more. Okay, uh, Immunoleptis, whatever, it says a lot. And these parasites can be, we are going to see that this is the Ascaris Lumbricoids. This is the mouth of the um, uh, Taenia saginata, Taenia solium. So there is different parasites. There is parasites that measure one, one, two millimeters. And there's other parasites that can measure about 18 feet long. Yes, 18 feet long that can be located along the small and large intestine. So this actually different size. And this is the head of one of these. This is uh, the taenia. And this, what happened is, can you see the like, kind of teeth here? They are going to, this is the mucosa of the intestine, the lumen of the intestine, and the parasite is going with the teeth, are going to actually be attached or make bleeding the mucus of the, of the lining of the intestine. That blood is coming into the mouth of the parasite, and that's what they eat. Okay? So I'm going to show you, this is the Ancylostoma duodenale or Necator americanus, whatever. There are many names. I love parasites, seriously. So, and then look at that. Can you see that? That is not carbonara. It's not spaghetti. Okay? It's actually Ascaris lumbricoids. Can you see the amount of uh, Ascaris can appear? Okay? Hello? Yes, that's just a lot to take yes. in, Sorry. A lot of what? <laughs> okay. That's just a lot. Yeah, it's a lot, yeah. Okay, so, uh, all right, so we already talked about that. Now, let's talk about the lymphatic system. Okay, the lymphatic system. So, this is this lymphatic system is going to be, if you can imagine, the Highway 101 is going to, are going to be the arteries. Highway uh, 280 will be the veins. And El Camino Real will have the lymphatic system, the lymphatic system. Without more delay, I'm going to, going to show you where the, where is my picture? Oh my God, don't tell me it's not here. There you are, there you are. All right, so this picture, we are going to start with this picture, lymphatic system. I'm going to go very, going to the point. Okay, so here we have the artery, artery, then is coming the arteriole, then the capillaries, can you see the capillaries? And then they're going to go to the venules and then to the veins, correct? Yes. On the background, on the background you see uh, nervous tissue, but it can be the kidney, could be the liver, could be the spleen, could be 
in testing, whatever, anything. So, but all tissues are going to have these arteries, arterioles, uh, capillaries, venules, and veins. So now, this is where you have the, the deliver of nutrients at the level of the capillaries. Okay, perfect. So that is the uh, uh, arteria and uh, arteries and veins. Now, let's talk about the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is going to be, look at this, look, this is look like a cactus, like a cactus in between. This lymphatic system are going to, uh, are going to uh, uh, begin between the capillaries, between the capillaries, between the capillaries. These green are vessels. These are the lymphatic vessels, lymphatic vessels, lymphatic vessel. The lymphatic vessel, they have the tunica intima, the tunica media, and the tunica, uh, uh, um, the adventitia or outer tunica. Okay? So it's exactly the same, having the, the same three layers of the vessels. In addition to that, the lymphatic system is going to contain valves, 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 valves. When it's going to be needed valves, that is telling you something important that the lymphatic fluid, that is the fluid inside the lymphatic vessels, are going to run towards the heart against gravity. So that's why we need valves. So the lymphatic system is not going from head to toe. They are going to go from, from direction from the, from the toes to the heart. Is that, is that, is that, understand? Is, is that okay? We okay that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now, the lymphatic vessel are going to start as a cool de sac. It's like a no exit a, a street. So it's going, this is the close up. Can you see? This is the close up. So it's basically like a finger glove. That is the beginning of the lymphatic vessel. That is the beginning of the lymphatic vessel. So, in conclusion, what I want to tell you is there is no connection. There is no connection between the lymphatic and the arteries, veins, capillaries, etc. So there is no a di direct connection. There is not going to be attached. There is no a continuation. It's going to be a different structure. There are side by side, yes, but they are not having a direct connection. Is that clear? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, the lymphatic vessels the lymphatic vessels do not contain blood. The lymphatic vessels do not contain blood. What they are going to contain is the lymphatic fluid. Lymphatic fluid. Lymphatic fluid. What is the lymphatic fluid? Are going to be water, electrolytes, are going to be white cells, is going to be uh, uh, some proteins, and some fat. Fat. So that is the component of the lymphatic fluid. I didn't mention, I didn't put red blood cells. We don't have red blood cells in the lymphatic fluid. You okay with that? Can you go back, please? Okay. So it contains water, electrolytes, white blood cells, proteins, and what? Fat. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. All right. What is the function of the lymphatic system? The function, so before that, I'm going to show this image here. Okay, look at it. Here we have the blue veins, the red arteries, so the systemic circulation, the, the pulmonary or minor circulation is there. But in addition, we have this green stuff. Can you see here? From the tissues, at the end of the tissue, they are going to collect this water that is composed uh, of lymphatic fluid. And where, where it goes? It goes to the heart, towards the heart. Not directly to the heart, as we are going to see in the next slides, but they are going to drain all, all the lymphatic fluid. Lymphatic fluid drains into the venous system. Venous system. We will see how is that happening. OK? All right. So that is number one. Number two, we are going to talk about the functions of the lymphatic system. The function of the lymphatic system is fluid balance. So what does it mean? 
Look at it. If you see in this picture, there is openings here in the capillaries. And these capillaries are going to make wa escape water. So water starts to escape here. Water, water, water starts to escape into the tissue from the capillaries. Water. So what is the function of the lymphatic fluid, the lymphatic system? One of the functions is to collect the excess of water in the tissue. Collect. It's going to collect the excess of fluid in the tissue. So between cells, correct? So that is okay? You okay with that? Yes. Okay, so that's why if you have problems with the lymphatic system, you can have edemas that we will talk about another time. Then we have protection for infection. Why? Because they contain the white cells. That is where is the highway for the white cells. The white cells are going to make shortcuts. They are going to travel through not only blood, by the bloodstream, arteries and veins, but they are going to travel through the lymphatic system. Lymphatic system. You okay? And the other one, function, we are talking about the functions, is the absorption of fat and some proteins. Okay? So those are the three functions that I'm going to ask in the next exam. All right? You follow me? Yes. 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 All right. Now, from the origin of the lymphatic vessel, I'm going to make it purple. I don't know if that is going to be... It's okay, the color? Oh, no. I'm going to make it green, okay? So let's finish this. We have here the lymphatic vessel. The lymphatic vessel is going to run upwards against gravity towards the uh, heart. In the pathway, the lymphatic vessel that they have these, uh, these uh, valves, right, valves, in the middle, they are going to have a nodule, like this. And they are going to continue. This is called the lymphatic node. Lymphatic node. So, yes, it's like you having, you go into El Camino Real, and in the middle there is a, like a, a station that you need to pass one and over and over. So, this is the lymphatic node. And what is the main function of the lymphatic node? Is to filter, filtration, filter. So, what is inside? What is inside of the lymphatic node? This lymphatic node, we have lymphocytes. Lymphocytes. Lymphocytes B and the lymphocytes T. So those are the what we call the specific immunity. So that is the, the one who have uh, a specific target. Lymphocytes B and lymphocytes T. So once the bacteria, if there is a bacteria, coming from the vascular space, or the arteries escaping from the capillaries, the lymphatic fluid is going to, the lymphatic is going to collect that bacteria. And the bacteria is traveling all this way. And when they reach this lymphatic node, this is like a custom. It's like a filter. It's a filter where they are not going to allow, they are not going to allow the bacteria to progress into the system. So the lymphocytes B and T are going to kill the bacteria, are going to kill the bacteria. So that's why this lymphatic node is going to work as a filter. You okay with that? Yes. Okay. So this lymphatic node is going to measure between two millimeters up to two centimeters. So when you have, when you have a cold, for example, we have a cold. And the virus is getting into the mucus of your throat, let's put it that way. And the virus then is going to be passing through the lymphatic fluid. The lymphatic fluid is going to detect the virus by in the, in the nodule. And what happened with the nodule? The nodule starts to get enlarged. Why? Because they are going to produce a large number of lymphocytes B and T. So that means that that nodule is on war. They're fighting. They're fighting. And that is when 
you have an infection, you can see some small balls appear in your neck, right? Yes or no? Yes. So that is basically when you have the maximum size is two centimeters, a little bit less than one, less than one, less than uh, one quarter of, uh, I mean, smaller than one inch. But when you is bigger than two centimeters, it's palpable. You can palp that. So how many lymphatic nodes we have? We have about three, about 600 nodes. 600 nodes spread out all over the body. All over the body. So these lymphatic nodes are going to be high concentrated okay, in high number in the armpit, the axilla, the groin, and the neck. So those are the three areas where mostly of these lymphatic nodes are located. But the lymphatic nodes are concentrated in different parts, or, uh, in other parts of the body, in every single organ. The kidney have lymphatic nodes? Yes. The spleen have lymphatic nodes? Yes. The liver have lymphatic nodes? Yes. The lungs have lymphatic nodes? Yes. All the, the GI tract, esophagus, stomach, small, large intestine, they have lymphatic nodes? Yes. The heart have lymphatic nodes? Yes. Around the aorta, aorta and the IVC, they have lymphatic nodes? Yes. So lymphatic nodes are these sentinels who are basically filtering in case there is some stranger or bacteria. Are you okay with that? Yes. Yeah. So in this case, you see here, let me see what is this. Is, uh, okay. So here we have this, the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system, see all the highway to, uh, high, I mean, El Camino Real. So here we have in the armpit, high concentration. In the groin, high concentration. In the neck, high concentration. But other parts of the body have lymphatic nodes too, okay? The armpit is related for when you have breast, breast uh, problems, breast cancer, the lymphatic nodes because the cancer cells, cancer cells because bioscience, because they have a mutation. Mutation means a change of the gene of the cell. That the cell will not know when to stop to multiply. But when you change by mutation a gene, you are changing the recipe of the protein. That protein is a new protein because it's mutated protein and is acting like an antigen, like a bacteria. Like, I didn't say bacteria, it's, not, it's going to uh, act as a stranger. And that's how the cancer cells are being tried to be killed by the lymphatic nodes with the lymphocytes B and T. So that's why when somebody has breast cancer, the lymphatic nodes are being swollen on the on the armpit. So that is self-examination when somebody have uh, some this type of problem. All right. So now these lymphatic vessels, these lymphatic vessels are going to travel towards the heart, 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 towards the heart. Now, how is going to be that pathway? Okay, so there you are. Let me see if I have a picture here. All right, so here we have, if you see here in this image, very clear. So here we have the heart. This is, should be the heart here, the heart. The heart here, we have the right atrium. And the right atrium here, we have the superior vena cava. Superior vena cava. We have the superior vena cava. This is the superior vena cava. Then here we have the brachiocephalic vein, and we have another brachiocephalic vein. The two brachiocephalic veins are going to form the superior vena cava. The brachiocephalic veins are going to be formed by two vessels, review from previous class, the subclavian vein and the jugular vein. I'm going to put it in red, just to be sort of a bit better. So this is the subclavian vein, and this is the jugular vein. The jugular vein plus the subclavian vein form the brachiocephalic vein in both sides. Jugular vein, subclavian vein, and now a brachiocephalic vein. 
two brachiocephalic veins form the superior vein cava that is going to drain into the heart. Okay? Now, so knowing that, knowing that, we are going to see that the, there is this green El Camino Real are going to come all the way collecting all the all the lymphatic fluid from from all below the back, all below this line. So all the lymphatic fluid are going to be collected, lower extremities, pelvis, abdomen, they are going to be collected bit by bit here by this vessel. This vessel, before to give you the name, are going to drain here. Look at this. Here we have the superior vena cava. Here we have the brachiocephalic vein. So how many brachiocephalic veins? We have two. The brachiocephalic vein is formed by the jugular vein and the subclavian vein. Jugular vein and the subclavian vein. And look at this. On the on the this is the this is the left side and this is the right side of the body. So these lymphatic vessels are going to drain into the subclavian vein. So if you see here, all the way here are going to drain here into the subclavian vein. So the lymphatic fluid drains into the subclavian vein. The lymphatic fluid drains into the into the into the what? Subclavian vein. The lymphatic fluid drains into the subclavian vein. Where is draining? Where is draining the lymphatic uh, fluid into the subclavian vein? Subclavian vein, in both sides, and we are going to check that in a few moments. Okay, so we okay with that? Okay. Yes. So here we have. This is twenty five percent, and this is seventy five percent. So this seventy five percent is collecting the lymphatic fluid from the lower extremities, from the pelvis, from the half of the pelvis, half of the, uh, of the whole pelvis, half of the abdomen, and the left upper extremity, and the, all the half of the head and neck. So all this is 75%. And all these 75% are going to drain into the, into the left subclavian vein. Left subclavian vein. So this vessel you see here that is bringing up all the lymphatic fluid are going to be called the thoracic duct. Thoracic duct. Uh, there you are. That thoracic duct. That thoracic duct. That is on the left side. So, so where is going to drain the thoracic duct? The thoracic duct are going to drain in the subclavian vein. Which subclavian vein? the left subclavian vein. You okay with that? Dr. G, so 75% of fluid on the left this side drains yeah. through the thoracic duct to the left side SVC? That's totally well done. Excellent. You okay with that? Yes. 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 All right, so here we have here the 75% is going to drain into the thoracic duct and it drains into the left subclavian vein. Now, the 25% are going to drain too in the subclavian vein, but this is going to be called more simple word is the right thoracic, the right lymphatic duct. It's called the right, this to not thoracic, right lymphatic duct. So you see here, they are going to drain. This is the subclavian. This is the subclavian. And the, that is where it's draining the thoracic duct. And here where it's draining the, the right lymphatic duct. That is going to collect 25% of the lymphatic fluid. You okay? Yes. Okay. So time is we're going to talk about next class. What time is it, please? 12.15. OK, so uh, we will talk about the lymphatic organs. Uh, that is partially the introduction of what is coming next class. So we are going to leave it there. Just remember, I'm going to ask only what I teach. 
Okay, so that's why it's important to come to class, please. Okay, all right. So any question?